Welcome to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, the program in which we take an intergenerational approach to the book of Revelation. I'm John Pauline. I'm professor of religion at Loma Linda University. And with me is Guillerme Borda, who is? Yes, I'm, I'm a doctoral student in the New Testament uh, at Andrews University. And, and you've, you brought a friend along uh, yes. today, and I'd like you to introduce yes. him. Today we have uh, Luis Gustavo Assis, who is also a doctoral student, but in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and he's also a pastor. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Absolutely. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, as Guilherme uh, has said, my name is Luis Gustavo Assis, originally from Brazil, so the Brazilians are the majority today, <laughs> and uh, a student of uh, Old Testament for quite some time, and I mean, there is no end to learning from that part of the Bible or from any part of the Bible. And currently working as a pastor uh, in the uh, churches of Anaheim and Orange in Orange County here in Southern California. So it is a delight to, to be here with you both studying, studying Bible. Good to have you with us. And uh, some of you may be aware we are missing Iris uh, tonight. And uh, unfortunately, there's uh, uh, been an uh, emergency with her family in Germany. And uh, she has needed to go back uh, for possibly a considerable length of time. And so uh, we appreciate very much. Uh, do you like Luis or Gustavo better? I normally go by Gustavo. Gustavo. But Luis is part of the name. So. Yeah. All right. And Gustavo is, uh, is fine. And we really appreciate you, uh, you coming in uh, to, uh, to pick up uh, uh, the slack that we have here and uh, looking forward to especially your background in the, the earlier scriptures, the, the Hebrew Bible, uh, etc. The book of Revelation is full of Old Testament. And if you don't know something about the Old Testament, you'll never understand Revelation. So we're looking forward to that uh, as we move forward. Uh, let's start by going back to uh, the seventh uh, plague, the seventh bowl in Revelation. So if you'll grab your Bibles, uh, Revelation chapter 16 and verses 17 through 21. And I've asked uh, Guillerme to read that for us. Sure. Revelation 16 verses 17 to 21. Uh, today I'm reading from the New King James Version. And the text says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. So, what do you think? Uh, in verse 18, uh, it talks about lightnings, noises, thunders, and a great earthquake. In the previous program, uh, we looked back at some earlier places in the book of Revelation where these same things occur. Uh, but the question is, do you think these are literal or symbolic? And if they're symbolic, what are they symbolic of? Well, when you go earlier in the book, in chapter 4, uh, after the messages to the seven churches, and then John um, now gets to see the heavenly throne. There is a reference to lightning, thunderings, and voices, which in the Greek is the same, uh, you know, sounds of voices, a phone. It's, it's mentioned there. It says, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. But there, it don't have... The earthquake. So that's one of the differences. But then later, uh, with, uh, in the series of the seven trumpets, it's very interesting because right before the seven trumpets, and then at the very end, you have the noises, the thunderings, the lightnings, and you have an earthquake. Uh, sort of 
as an as an as an envelope, so to so to speak, uh, book ends for the seven trumpets right in the beginning in chapter eight, verse five. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And then after that, you have the the sounding of the trumpets. And then at the very very end, uh, after the seventh. Uh, trumpet is sounded then you have then the temple of God was open in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple and there were lightnings noises thunderings an earthquake and great hail um, it's so it, it's in that scene you know uh, you, you can tie it with 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 judgment also with with victory but then in chapter 4 verse 5 uh, you don't have the earthquake but you have the other elements associated with the throne of God you know, somehow, one thing it could, that could be also part of the, of the situation is that somehow these phenomena, at least the lightnings, the thunderings, and the noises, seem to be associated with God's, uh, uh, God's uh, His manifestation, His presence, the overwhelming nature of His presence. But also, but then with the earthquake, then it seems to make it more closely related specifically with judgment. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it was a literal or symbolic. I was going to say, you haven't really answered my yeah, question. Yeah, you know, you know. I've let, got, let to, got to give here. the context, you Gustav, know. Go ahead. Let, what do you think it is? How, how do you, you know, when you sense this, is yeah. it, well, especially with your background, the Old Testament, mm -hmm. you have similar kinds of things going on there? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. as Guilherme was speaking, I was thinking of Micah chapter 1. Uh -huh. When God leaves his temple and start coming down to judge Judah mm -hmm. and the mountains are melting. So there is this great noise. There is the, the earthquake. In Ezekiel chapter 1, when the throne of God is manifested to, to Ezekiel in, in southern Babylonia, uh, there is also an earthquake. But there is a say, it is not saying it is done. It is saying blessed is the glory of God from its place. So there is... A manifestation of God, for sure. With the example of Micah, I think it is judgment that is taking place. So God is about to perform his last act of judgment. And in Micah, it is only, let's say, to Judah. But now in the book of Revelation, it's the entire earth. The whole well, world. Um, coming back to that, my, my understanding is that whenever God speaks in the Old Testament prophets, it's always poetry. So when the mountains are melting, is that literal? Of course not. I mean, is it, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when God speaks of himself, he's always talking poetry. Yeah. And poetry tends to be, you know, not A so. A lot of metaphors. Yeah. Yeah. Concrete. It's, exactly. it, it's going all over the place. Why do you think that is? I think it is using what people knew about the reality of the world to demonstrate, a, like, let's say, a deeper truth, more profound truth about who God is. When he speaks, everything changes. Everything is, uh, it turns everything upside down, basically. And, yeah, I, I think the Mount Sinai example also ref is also alluding to that kind of manifestation of God, lightning, and, mm -hmm. I mean, the idea of lightning in the Bible is quite interesting because the word for lightning is the same word for arrow of a bow and mm -hmm. arrow. Mm -hmm. So every time God is shooting arrows, is like lightning that you see in the sky. So all this, and this is from Psalms, mm -hmm. uh, Psalm 18 uses that language. So this is, of course, not literally the arrows of God. It is, a, let's say, a physical manifestation of a deeper truth that people thought about God. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think... I think people have a tendency sometimes to take the Bible at face value. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good, um, how should we put it? It's a good mental approach to take. I, you know, I want to take this seriously mm -hmm. as it is, mm -hmm. you see. And yet so often you can't take it literally. And if you do, you're going to misunderstand it, mm -hmm. you know. But anyway, let, literal yeah. or figurative, so, come yeah. back to you. What I would say is that uh, John... Um, witnessed those things he saw actually shaking and all of that but we do have a hint in the text that the historical referent of the earthquake would be symbolic mm -hmm. here 
Uh, it, because you see, with the lightning, the thundering, the voices, you can think, well, when God speaks, you have that, you know, so why couldn't that be literal? But the earthquake portion and what happens right next makes me think uh, that at least the earthquake is symbolic. Because look at this. Uh, when you go to um, um, verse 18 in your heaven, there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts. So it seems that this earthquake plays a role in the dividing of the city in three parts. Uh, the reason I say this is because when you go back to chapter 11, where I mentioned that there was a, uh, the earthquake mentioned at the end, but earlier, uh, if you go to chapter 11, verse 13, is you have it, another is earthquake. It a literal city. Uh, that is the question. It, it, well, yeah, so exactly, on, exactly. <laughs> if you go to 11, verse 13, you'd say um, the second woe, uh, sorry, 11, verse 13. In the same hour, this is when the two witnesses ascend to heaven. Then in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Over there, uh, when we discussed, we saw the two witnesses as symbolic. And uh, so their ascension will be symbolic. And I would suggest that just as that earthquake there seems to be symbolic and the city also symbolic, I would suggest that the earthquake here also seems to be symbolic mm -hmm. and it seems to play a role in the splitting of the symbolic city of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, whether there might also be at the time a literal earthquake, just as the earth shook when Jesus died, mm -hmm. You know, but, uh, but the point is that, it, to me, it's not, even if God chooses to also have a literal quick at the point, to kind of, as a way to show, just as he did at the cross, there was literal darkness, but there was also a symbolic darkness involved. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that it's important that we don't miss the symbolic dimension here uh, that is present, because it's a city that is symbolic, that is mm -hmm. being split in three parts, is being undone. No, oh, and, and just to reinforce what you're saying, I think if someone decides to take this literally, you have to even consider the drawing of the Euphrates earlier in the chapter as mm -hmm. also literal. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. of course, the Euphrates is, is drying up uh, as we speak, but that doesn't mean it is the fulfillment of this prophecy, of, mm -hmm. of that part, portion of Scripture. Uh, one final uh, item here about the, the, I mean, this last manifestation of God carrying His judgment is so massive that uh, one element that is missing in the Old Testament about the, let's say, the day of the Lord that also uses all these um, items that we are discussing here is the moving of the islands that very rarely the Old Testament prophets are concerned because, I mean, they are far away. They are not part of their daily life. John here is in an island. Uh, and he's right. aware of that. Mm -hmm. And so he's even alluding to the impact of that earthquake, not, e not only in the uh, continent, but also in the, um, in the islands. Mm. Very good. Well, let me follow up on something both of you have said. <coughs> you brought in Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think uh, that's, that's an interesting background, this idea of symbolism. I direct your attention to Hebrews chapter 12 because I think that is relevant to what we are talking about here. And in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 26 through 29, it says, his voice, speaking of God, mm -hmm. shook the earth then. He's talking about Mount Sinai. Yeah. Shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And this expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Mm -hmm. All right, so this final earthquake is shattering everything that's earthly, everything that's temporal, mm -hmm. preparing the way for an entirely new reality. Mm -hmm. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service and reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. So there are things which cannot be shaken. 
that survived this earthquake, and what would those be? Just before I forget, you see, you mentioning those things that can be shaken, those that cannot be shaken. Yeah. And we're speaking of a, a shaking, an earthquake, mm -hmm. and a city that is being split. In Hebrews 13, 14, you have the reference for here. We have no continuing or remaining yeah. city. Uh, I think it's the same Hebrew verb there. <laughs> but we seek the one to come. So the only city that truly cannot be shaken is the heavenly Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Any city, whether literal or symbolic, that is human, you know, let's mm -hmm. say uh, any of these fallen cities uh, or even uh, the literal city even of Jerusalem that was blessed by God so for so many years, those cities are not remaining cities. Rome was not a remaining city. We look for the one that is to come. And Babylon, the symbolic city, this eschatological Babylon, is not a remaining city. So it's also good news that Babylon, when there's an earthquake, it splits. It tells you, uh, it's such great news because the reality of oppressive Babylon, this symbolic city that stands for this oppressive system, is a transient reality. Mm -hmm. It will not last forever. See, the New Testament encourages us to live abundantly in this world, in Christ that the life we have in Christ is the best possible kind of life in this world. But the trouble is sometimes we get so enamored of this world mm. and so impressed with the things of this world that we lose the focus on the things that cannot be shaken. Mm. And when you come to the end of your life, you will want to have lived it for the things which cannot be shaken. Because if you get to the end of your life and you look back and it was a bunch of game playing and TV watching and you say, well, how much is that worth? It's just going to get flushed away like a toilet, mm. you see. Wow. But if you invest it in the things which cannot be shaken, they will have eternal value. The people you invested in here, you will see the fruit of that in eternity and you will have a, an eternal uh, reward, you can say, just in seeing the difference that you made Yes. In this life, you see, investing in the things that cannot be shaken, uh, that's what makes a difference. Yeah, and, and to, to echo what you were saying here, the New Testament authors uh, were living in a time that there was a, a let's say, a Greek uh, school of thought that was promoting this kind of, a, let's say, healthier way to look at relationships and things, and mm -hmm. it was stoicism. Uh, the problem with stoicism, which is great from a, let's say, horizontal level is that mm -hmm. it makes you be more disciplined, value what is really important in life, but is lacking let the vertical comp components, mm -hmm. the metaphysical aspects, the relationship with God and so on. So it is no wonder that many Stoics, when they encountered Christianity, they became Christians mm -hmm. because they, they found something that was lacking in their approach to life and looking for uh, what is lasting in life, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. simply the transitory. Mm -hmm. And that's something we need to remind ourselves of every day, pretty much, because it's so easy to be distracted. Sometimes you're bouncing from one thing to another. Then you come to the end of the day, and it's like it's all just a blur. Mm -hmm. You see, and at times like that, to catch a breath, take a moment, remind yourself of the things that ultimately matter. Uh, that, uh, that is something we all need uh, You asked Gustavo about poetry in the Old yeah. Testament. This, uh what you were talking about reminds me of what C.T. Studd once penned in his poem. Um, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Good. That's good. That's a... Look that's, at you, a Brazilian quoting English poetry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. We've got about uh, seven, eight minutes left. I want, to, I want to turn the subject just a little bit because you get to verse 19 <laughs> in chapter 16. It says that Babylon falls into three parts. Now, students of prophecy now, I got something to sink their teeth into. Babylon, end time Babylon falls into three parts. What are those three parts? I'm glad that I'm not a New Testament scholar. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that? <laughs> but that, that is, that is uh, mm -hmm. I was trying to look for um, Old Testament, uh, let's say precedents for mm -hmm. that idea. Couldn't find in the oracles against Babylon. Uh, but there are 
perhaps representations of the three, uh, let's say, members of the unholy trinity uh, mm -hmm. that are presented in the chapter here. Mm -hmm. Or not only in this chapter, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, yeah. but also in other parts of the book, chapter, chapters 12 and 13. And yeah, and is there, and just to go back to what Guilherme said, is there a moment in Revelation, especially describing the New Jerusalem, that we have a, let's say, a three part tight structure, three parts, or, or is this mm. isolated? Yeah. Or I, I, I think you, you go back to Ezekiel, and isn't there, Jerusalem is going to fall, and there's three parts there's those who are killed. Oh, yes, chapter those five. who go into captivity yes. and those yes. who remain. Uh -huh. So that there's uh, an idea of the okay. three parts. And you say, wait a minute, that's Jerusalem. Uh -huh. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad you look to see if, if in Babylon you see the three parts. But sometimes in Revelation, Babylon and Jerusalem are the same thing. Yeah, interesting. Old Jerusalem becomes Babylon. And you think, uh, for example, um, in the Exodus, when they enter the Promised Land, mm -hmm. Uh, the Canaanites are bad. They're the idol worshipers, mm -hmm. okay? The Israelites are good. They're serving the true mm -hmm. God. The Canaanites got to be destroyed, mm -hmm. you know? Israelites can flourish in the land, but you have a reversal. Yeah. Right at the beginning, you have Rahab, the Canaanite, who because she served God in a very crucial situation, is invited to be part of the people. She receives the life of Israel. Mm -hmm. Achan, on the other hand, who did not follow God's instructions, sought greedily for himself. Mm -hmm. He ends up getting the fate of the Canaanites. The, the, the mm -hmm. two are reversed. So God is not ethnic here. He allows people to make their decisions Absolutely. And, and, and goes on that basis. Uh, uh, on that but note. So, there, so that Jerusalem, Israel became uh -huh. Canaan. Jerusalem becomes Babylon yeah. sometimes. Even. Absolutely. I, and I'm really happy that you brought that up, uh, that comparison between Ahab, uh, Rahab and Achan. Uh, someone did a, a calculation of the words for the destruction of Jericho mm -hmm. and the uh, sparing of Rahab and her family. The biblical text is more focused on the sparing of Rahab and her family than the destruction of Jericho. And we ha we sing more about the destruction. I mean, not sing, but yeah. you remember that Elvis song. Mm -hmm. uh, about the walls of Jericho and falling the down. the walls came tumbling down. Exactly. So we, yeah. we know that part of the story, and we think that is the most important yeah. part of the story. But no, the sparing is more important. Uh, that is a, a well-made uh, point. Uh, I appreciate what you said. But, you know, uh, I think the reason why the city of Jerusalem is being destroyed might echo many of the reasons why Jerusalem is, uh, uh, Babylon is being destroyed here. The oppression the idolatry, all that were problems that Jerusalem was, let's say, witnessing, was experiencing on a daily basis in the times of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, that culminated with the destruction of the city by the Babylonians. Now we see Babylon being destroyed by the same reasons, uh, mm -hmm. by God this time. All right. Well, I think Gustavo made a good point that the, the three parts of Babylon seem to go back to verse 13. Uh, of chapter 16, where it says, out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet came three unclean spirits mm -hmm. like frogs. And uh, I think you have uh, echo here of chapter 13. Mm -hmm. You have the dragon, you have the beast from the sea, which is often called simply the beast. So those two are clear. But then you have the false prophet, and it's kind of like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wasn't it a beast from the earth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was. But the beast from the earth called fire down from heaven to earth. Mm -hmm. Like who? Elijah. 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 Yeah. Okay. The prophet of the Old Testament, yeah. the most famous, greatest prophet of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. called fire down from heaven. And that's what the beast from the land does. Mm -hmm. So it, it gets the name of, uh, of being the false prophet uh, and those three make up Babylon. But the question I want to ask you, uh, Guillerme, are, are there any entities like that today? I mean, if we, we, who, who's building into end time Babylon? Where, where, where do we look for that? Well, you know, just as the city Babylon is, we see it as symbolic. We also see each of these as symbolic entities too, right? We don't expect a city that will be built 
by a dragon and uh, two other uh, symbolic entities as we see uh, in yeah. chapter 13, right? In chapter th They're chapter clearly 13. figurative, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. they're clearly yeah. Uh, figurative and symbolic. Uh, throughout this, this study, we have um, this, I have to refer our viewers to uh, previous episodes where we have discussed chapter 13. Uh, and uh, we have seen the dragon uh, as representing uh, Satan. Mm -hmm. So um, Babylon is associated with Satan and what he does. Um, and then you have also the sea beast. We saw it related with uh, Papal Rome. And so Babylon also is associated with Papal Rome. And then I remember we were discussing, I think this was when we were still recording through Zoom, everybody through Zoom, mm -hmm. uh, when we discussed about the beast that comes out of the, the sea, and then there's the image of the beast. Um, when we talked, sorry, the beast that comes out of the land, and then the, there is also, or come out of the earth, and then there's the image of the beast also. When we talked about the beast that comes out of the land, we have uh, presented the interpretation that it refers historically to the United States of America. Surprisingly enough, and I have to refer our viewers to previous episodes because it's a longer discussion than mm -hmm. we have time for. So we, are ex we, we expect, looking at Bible prophecy, to see uh, this forming of an allegiance with powers associated with, with these religious and political related to these entities. Mm -hmm. And I think the bottom line when we get into chapter 17 is that end time Babylon is a worldwide religious power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That what we are seeing here is Babylon is the coming together of religions that may not seem too possible right now, mm -hmm. but somehow the religions of the world will find a common cause mm -hmm. in a time of great disaster, perhaps, uh, climate change, whatever it may be. Uh, and in a time of desperation, people will say, well, maybe God is punishing us, judging us. We need to get our lives right and all come together. And so Babylon is that type of entity. Well, we will continue this conversation as we complete chapter 16. And we will look forward to next time with you on GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises. See you then. <music>